Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. Welcome to part five of my Texas Chainsaw Massacre series review with a look back at Marcus and Spell's 2003 remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is currently streaming on Stars. There's probably no conversation more diverse in film than that of the remake. Some loathe them, some love them, and some see remakes as an opportunity to creatively expand on a beloved film or franchise. Personally, I find the concept of remakes exciting. Not for the potential to see classic shots and moments modernized, but rather to see a director's new horrifying vision for a film and characters that I love. The early 2000s saw a plethora, often to a fault, of shot-for-shot horror remakes, making the emphasis on directors taking creative risks to be an exception rather than the rule. Nispel's remake falls somewhere in between, as it's a stylish as hell but fairly safe remake that capitalizes on the sweaty southern grit of Texas Chainsaw and Leatherface's ferocity. And while there are countless recreations and nods to the original film, Nispel adds just enough of his cinematic flair and sensibilities that this avoids becoming an overbearing shot-for-shot remake. First and foremost, the remake is prominent as cinematographer Daniel Pearl, who shot the original film, returns, something he said he'd never do. Part of what sold him was that Nispel was a longtime collaborator and friend of Pearl's. It certainly also helped that Michael Bay was attached to produce, bringing notoriety, but also, and some would say more importantly, a real budget this time. It's easy to see how Pearl could be persuaded as remaking his 74 classic with buzz and cash this time around, something the original had neither of, seems like too good of an offer for him to pass up. I remember the first time I watched the film's trailer and saw Michael Bay's name attached to it and thought, really? That guy? Granted, I grew up in an era that knew Bay for his larger-than-life Transformers movies, as well as donning the coveted industry rep as being the slow-mo explosions guy. But, in my ignorance, what I saw as a detriment to the film ended up being the drive that gave us a solid slasher remake. Bay drafted the blueprint for the remake, wanting to dial the tone back to that of the original. No jokes or humor. Further showing Bay's passion for the project, he produced a completely black test trailer where you could only hear a woman running through a house screaming, and hear the floorboards creak as Leatherface hunts her down, revving his chainsaw. He sold the movie to New Line Cinema Studio without the team having written a single page of dialogue. Dialogue would be up to screenwriter Scott Kozar, who was tapped to write the remake. In an interview as part of the making of feature, Chainsaw Redux, Kozar stated, I went in knowing I couldn't simply replicate or redo the original film. Which, I mean, come on, it seems like a fairly simple realization, but it's one a lot of shot-for-shot remakes rarely take into consideration. Kozar decided to reinterpret or expand upon several original scenes while also adding numerous nods to the original, which makes for a familiar but new and terrifying feeling film. To that point, Nispel's remake begins in a faithful manner to the original. We're treated to a news bulletin detailing the horrific crimes that would befall a group of youngsters on their summer road trip across Texas. Also returning from the original film is narrator John Larroquette, who would also do the narration for the opening of Nispel's remake. The movie begins like a true crime doc, presenting evidence collected after Leatherface's rampage. We also get brief tweaking to the lore of everyone's favorite cannibal family, previously known as the Sawyers, then the Slaughters, and now are simply the Hewitt family. This might seem like an innocuous detail, but it helps to establish that Nispel is treating this as a fresh start for the series, and a return to a normal name, and I mean, Slaughter was a bit on the nose. The Hewitt family's cannibalistic tendencies are also significantly played down in Nispel's remake, as now it's only ever implied what they're doing with the meat that they collect from people. I mean, come on, we know what they're doing with that meat. But for this to be a true slasher like any other, you need to have a group of new youths for the chopping block. This time around, our young gang of protagonists are on their way back from Tijuana, driving a VW bus, not unlike the one in the original film. Of the group, the two most notable characters being Aaron, played by Jessica Biel, and Morgan, played by Jonathan Tucker, as the others mostly serve as fodder for old Leatherface's saw. Similarly to the original, the youth stop to pick up a clearly traumatized hitchhiker. Once aboard, the hitchhiker begins rambling about her friends being dead, before revealing a concealed handgun and committing suicide in the back of the van. This early moment serves as a terrific display of Nispel's overall approach to his remake, by combining a familiar scene from the original and turning the volume up to 11 through a startling display of practical gory and startling display of practical gory effects in cinematography. The camera quite literally explores the hitchhiker's head wound far more intimately than anyone would ever want, 
as the camera passes through her mouth and out the exit wound to show the viewer the youth's horrified reaction. It's a hell of a gruesome way to start the film, and for my money, I'd take a deviation from a familiar scene over a shot-for-shot -shot remake any day. Despite the subsequent three sequels to Toby Hooper's sun-scorched original film, none were quite able to capture the same sweaty madness as Hooper did. The sequels either veered off the horror path completely, dabbling in humor and satire, while the third film ditched the sun entirely in favor of darkness. While these tonal and stylistic deviations worked for some, for my money, I've always wanted someone to build off of Texas Chainsaw's original framework, something that drives my admiration for Nispel's remake. Whether it's the Hewitt family's gas station butcher shop or their dilapidated plantation home, you can feel the sweat and grime of the Texas heat beating down on you. Flies are everywhere, and you're bound to snag your elbow on a rusty nail if you aren't careful. It's an oppressive environment that Nispel has created, which bleeds into the constant sense of unease, giving the film the texture it truly needs. Even if a majority of the locales themselves are staples of the original, they're presented in a new stylish manner capturing the rank atmosphere of the original. The one location that's explored in far more detail is that of Leatherface's workshop, which is layered in so much detail you can almost smell the death emanating from it. As soon as you step off the stairs into the basement floor, you step into ankle-deep water that is accrued from a pipe that ruptured decades prior. We're given quick cuts highlighting Leatherface's various trophies he's collected from his victims over the decades. Fingers, ears, faces, teeth, you know, normal type collectibles. And then there's the half-sawed through corpses that he ensures to treat before tying off so as not to spoil the meat, just as any good butcher worth his salt would do. This hellish workshop really capitalizes on showing just how twisted and depraved Leatherface is, reminding the audience never to doubt him despite his childlike mind. Atmosphere aside, the most notable and interesting narrative tweak to the Texas Chainsaw's past formulaic format is Leatherface's physicality. Much like past films, Leatherface is portrayed as a child-minded butcher who abides by his family's every demand. Nispel also shoots him as far more imposing of a figure, shooting down and low to truly capture his hulking size. Leatherface has always been a thick slasher icon, but when pairing his size with a newfound foot speed, Nispel makes him the scariest he's ever been. The roar of his saw in the original was terrifying, but essentially served as a warning that he was nearby. Now, Leatherface's 40-yard dash time has improved to the point that when you hear the saw, it might be seconds before he severs one of your limbs. Speed has always been an inherently terrifying aspect of killers. Films which utilize speedy killers, a choice that strays from the genre trope of shambling killers, adds a sense of urgency as the margin of error is essentially nil. This is translated to the ferocity of Leatherface's first kill when Jessica Biel's boyfriend Kemper is searching the Hewitt's home and Leatherface rolls up behind him and suddenly strikes him with a hammer, dragging his spasming body into his lair before slamming his meat locker door behind him. This is not only a clear homage to the original film, but it shows that despite his thickness, Leatherface always brings the quickness. On the surface, this might seem like yet another innocuous detail, but it serves as an example of the value of remakes as visionary directors can inject a fresh dose of adrenaline to amplify age-old scares. This mindset was also used when approaching Leatherface's look, more specifically, alterations made to his mask. And to be honest, I'm less than in love with the slipknot quality professionalism which has been given to it. Gone are the DIY imperfections of the original, which gave it a patched together look. He does swap out this mask for the fresh mask which he stitches together consisting of Kemper's face, but this is a short-lived mask. It does give us the terrifying moment where Leatherface's hulking body turns to Jessica Biel, revealing he's wearing her dead boyfriend's face. Even if I'm not a fan of the overall look of his mask, in changing it to fit in Spell's vision, it provides the opportunity for new dimensions of terror, even if those dimensions are never as impactful as they could be. Nispel also makes it a point to give the viewer a look at the man underneath the mask. As Leatherface removes his old mask and reveals his gaunt face, which is missing a nose, which is alluded to having been eaten away by some sort of cancer, it's a moment I'm conflicted over. I don't feel it's necessary to show his face, but in doing so, it does humanize him a bit, and reinforces his mother's insisting that others have teased and traumatized him his entire life for the way he looks, which in turn would explain some of his rage, even if it doesn't necessarily justify it. But in typical Texas Chainsaw fashion, Leatherface is but one member of a motley crew of killers and cannibals alike. Newly introduced is Sheriff Hoyt, played by R. Lee Ermey, of Full Metal Jacket fame, and boy oh boy when I tell you he gives an unforgettably nasty performance, I mean it. The sheriff is the law around these parts, but from our introduction, he'd be a better fit for the sheriff of hell. From the moment we're introduced to him, his whole vibe is hostile, which shouldn't be a surprise, as he's a member of the Hewitt family after all. 
He treats having to respond to the suicide the youths reported as a chore, using carefree, dark humor, which would be more commonly found shared between fellow cops, rather than traumatized youths. While initially, his whole vibe is certainly not by the book, he plays into the youth's preconceived notions about the South and chalks it up to him being a redneck. Though, it doesn't take long for this facade to give way to a degree the youths can no longer overlook. From his insinuating the fellows have had their way with the hitchhiker's body, to groping the corpse himself, the sheriff's reckless actions and words are more resemblant of a drunkard than an officer of the law. Furthermore, he is more concerned for keeping his car clean than the state of the body which he wraps in special police issues saran wrap. According to Nispel, Ermi ad-libbed all of his dialogue for this sequence, which makes his despicable dialogue all the more shocking. During my rewatch, I developed a theory that perhaps the sheriff isn't even really a sheriff. Perhaps he murdered a real sheriff some years ago and took on the role to give the Hewitts control over the few hundred acres that make up the back roads of their redneck oasis. It makes sense, considering the family can simply make people who cross their path disappear, which is certainly convenient for a family of killers. Ermi's nastiness leaves an indistinguishable, complimentary mark on the film, as his take on the sheriff fits snugly into Nispel's sweaty southern aesthetic. Whether it's him forcing a sobbing youth to recreate the hitchhiker's suicide from the beginning of the film, or knocking out someone's teeth with a freshly polished off pint bottle of whiskey, he is the embodiment of evil. For as strong as he is, Ermi would reprise this role in the sixth series installment, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning, which, you guessed it, documents the origins of Leatherface. So I'm looking forward to visiting that film next week. Nispel's remake ends with the biggest deviation from the original film, that being the chase through the Blair meatpacking plant. Previous films had referenced the cause of the Sawyers turning to cannibalism was due in part to the meatpacking plant being closed, and they were out of work. No work means no money. No money means no food. So, cannibalism was the solution for that. The scene has Jessica Biel being the final survivor being chased by Leatherface through the empty Blair meatpacking plant, which feels very much like a second home for Leatherface. This cow carcass-filled house of horrors is the ideal spot for a final showdown, as it's filled with butchery implements and cadavers for Beale to hide within. It's a tense and bloody conclusion that sees Leatherface lose an arm in one of the more grotesque dismemberment scenes of the film. Though, I was honestly surprised by a lack of gore shown in the film, and a reason for that being divulged during the course of the interviews revolving around the deleted scenes of the film. And man oh man was this film quite different had the deleted scenes been included. The film was originally bookended by scenes set post the events of the Texas Chainsaw, where Jessica Biel's character has been confined to a psychiatric facility and is recounting her experience of escaping Leatherface to a journalist. In theory, I get it, but it applies needless excess to what was cut down to a lean and mean slasher. There was also a narrative where she was pregnant with Kemper's baby, which I'm relieved they cut out. Kind of hard to believe a pregnant woman could endure the amount of physical trauma as she does and have the baby survive. Being free from that encumbrance allows her actions to be more believable. Of the deleted scenes, which honestly were cut for a good reason, there's one that expands on Morgan's chandelier hanging kill that extended with added gore. I was surprised to learn that this was cut at the behest of Michael Bay, which in a spell agrees with, as they didn't want to lose the audience. Lose the audience meaning that some people that were too squeamish might bail on the movie at that point. Even though the film was released in 2003, I remain perplexed by studios' clear confusion as to who they think their audience consists of. At no point has anyone who is paying to see a Texas Chainsaw movie been like, let's score, please, and thank you. That being said, overall I find Marcus and Spell's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre to be a strong remake on a slasher classic. From the film's tobacco-stained color palette to reimagining the original structure by introducing several new locations, characters, and kills gives this my remake stamp of approval. It makes for one of my favorite entries in the series. Next week, I'll tackle Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning, the sixth entry and prequel to Nispel's remake, which will be a first time watch for me. So be on the lookout for that next part in my Texas Chainsaw Massacre series review, and I'll see you guys next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service and follow at Daily Horror Habit on Instagram and at Daily Horror Pod on Twitter.